the title of today's talk is the conflict between the outer self and the inner self. The title would suggest that we possess two selves, one outer self and one inner self. In fact, self is always one. The self has never been divided. Self is so much of one self that it cannot be divided even into the higher self or the lower self. It cannot be divided even into the individual self and the total self. The self cannot be divided. There is only one self. And that self, he is he himself. In truth, consciousness is one being, one self, indivisible, has never been divided and will never be divided. It is the experience of one indivisible self which creates the illusion of the many. The many is an illusion and one self is the reality. From the many we come to the one when we go from illusion to reality. If a person goes to sleep and has a dream, there is only one dreamer. In the dream, he may see hundreds of other persons. They do not become dreamers. They remain the dream. In a dream, there can be only one dreamer, not two. There cannot be two dreamers participating and creating one dream. Only one dreamer experiences the role of the self. All others are his experience as a dream. There is one dreamer and all others are dream creatures, although they look like him, they behave like him, they talk like him, they are independent in what they do in the dream. A person may go to sleep and dream and meet somebody in the dream with whom he has a quarrel <clears throat> or he hears some new things from the person in the dream. All that he is hearing is within himself because he alone is the dreamer. The other person may give ideas, knowledge, experience which the dreamer does not know in the dream. Still, there is only one dreamer. We cannot make two. This state of consciousness in which we are now living as the wakeful human beings is also a dream. It is a more vivid kind of dream in relation to the dream that we get while sleeping. But if we awake from this dream, we will find that all the people that we saw here, they did not have any individual selves. They were dream creatures created by the one dreamer that was the self who has woken up. If there are any other dreamers, they must be in the higher wakeful state and they would be having their own dreams. Two persons do not go to sleep and dream to enter into the same dream world. It is not possible. One person can create a dream world only one remains the dreamer, all others become creatures of the dream. Therefore, when he wakes up, all those many who were created because of the dreaming process disappear into the reality of wakefulness and one dreamer alone remains. In the same way, the experience of the many here is the experience of illusion. And when one wakes up into the reality, one alone remains who has created the illusion of the many. Therefore, there is only one true self. In illusion, it looks like the many. But while the illusion lasts, we take the illusion for reality. We call it illusion, not unreal. There is a difference between what is an illusion and what is unreal. And unreal is that which does not exist. Illusion is that which exists and appears to be real, but in reality is not real. But it exists. It is not non-existent. It is, exists as illusion. If a person dreams, you cannot say he has not had a dream. He has had a real dream. But the things and the persons he has met in the dream are unreal. The illusion is not that he had nothing and he calls it a dream. The illusion is that the dream he calls is real. In fact, the dream is a real dream. But the things and persons in the dream whom he takes to be real 
or not real. It is a little difficult subject, but I think it should be understood because this will give great insight into the nature of creation and how these levels of consciousness operate. There was once a mystic named Shankar in India who lived in Bombay and he was walking along the street. This is a story to illustrate the same point that I was making. He was walking along the street and on that street lived a magician. A magician is one who can create an illusion. That means he can make a thing look like real even if it is not real. The magician, by his power of illusion, threw a piece of string on the street and made it look like a snake. When Shankar with his disciples reached that point, he asked his disciples, what is there on the street? And they said, that is a snake. But one of the disciples, who had done his homework better than the others, he walked up and said, no, sir. In illusion, it is a snake. In reality, it is a piece of string. Shankar said, my dear boy, if you think it is a piece of string, why don't you pick it up? So he stepped forward and picked up the snake. And the snake coiled around his arm and bit him. When the snake bit him, this boy said, ouch. Then Shankar asked him, now tell me, is it a piece of string or is it real? And groaning with pain, that boy said, sir, in reality, it is a piece of string. In illusion, it is a snake. He said, tell me what is real? The piece of string or the ouch that you said? He said, both of, both of them are real. The point made in the story is, it is not necessary to have a real thing to create a real experience. You can have an unreal thing and create a real experience. Supposing in the dream state, we go to sleep and have a dream. In the dream state, somebody stabs you with a knife and you have pain. The pain is real, but the knife is not. When you wake up, the memory of the pain is still real, but the knife has disappeared. It was only a dream object. This many people make a mistake thinking that what is unreal cannot create real experience. On the other hand, the experience is always real because it has happened. The illusion part is that from a real experience, we start coming, jumping to the illusory conclusion that things must also be real. The illusion is not that the experience is real. That is not illusion, that is real. The experience is always real. The illusion is that from that experience, we think that the things of experience and the persons of experience must also be real. That is the illusion. When we in Eastern philosophy refer to maya or illusion, we refer in this sense, not in the sense of something being non-existent. It exists and is as real as ultimate reality. The experience of illusion is as real as reality itself. But the illusory part is that from that real experience, we start taking the unreal things also to be real. Therefore, the experience of this world, which is going around us, as an experience is real. Otherwise, we wouldn't feel the pain and pleasure. We would not feel the happiness and unhappiness. We would not be affected by it. It is real experience. But the things in this world, the persons in this world, who are giving us that real experience, they are unreal. And when we awake to a higher level of consciousness, the experience remains in memory, but the things and the persons disappear. Just like if we wake up from a dream, the experience and memory of the dream remains with us, but the persons and things of the dream disappear. It is important to realize that we cannot know while dreaming that it is a dream. If we could know, that dream would become unreal while we are still dreaming. It does not happen. Even if in the dream, we come to know and get the knowledge that this is a dream, what do we do? We don't realize, we don't awake that this is a dream. We begin to run about in the dream itself and tell all the dream, dream creatures 
It is a dream. It is a dream. We have found out. If we had really found out, who are we telling? When we wake up, we don't tell anybody. We don't go back to sleep to tell the dream creatures that we had a dream. Similarly, in this wakeful state, even when we come to know, but without realizing that this is an illusion, we start telling everybody who are illusion. We have found out this is illusion. This is not real. Don't believe it. Who are we telling? To be illusion? This only shows even when we know and speak the truth, we have not realized it. Realization comes by waking up, not by saying the truth, even illusion. Making a true statement in illusion does not make it an experience of reality. It only makes a true statement. The realization that it is truly an illusion only comes when you wake up. When we wake up from a dream in the morning, how do we know that it was a dream and we have woken up? I am asking this question because people come to me and ask, you talk of higher levels of consciousness and astral levels of experience. How do you know it is not a dream and not a fantasy? You may be putting suggestions into people's heads. They see fancy things and they come back and say, Oh, there are higher levels of consciousness. We had a trip into the astral world and we see wonderful things. Now we have come back into this world to tell you what we saw in the higher world. How do you know there is any such experience? What is the proof? We want proof that what you speak of as the astral experience indeed is a higher experience of wakefulness and not an experience of a dream state which is different from this experience. It's a good question. They have every right to find out what is the proof that the experience we talk of as astral or higher spiritual experience is indeed higher and is a wakeful experience. But I do not take too long to answer that question by putting another question to them. And I ask them, do you go to sleep every night? They say, yes. I said, do you have a dream? Yes, sometimes they do. I said, when you wake up in the morning, how do you know that you have woken up? What is the proof that you have woken up? And do you demand that proof? And no, we don't demand. We know we have woken up. I said, what do you mean we know? When I say I know it is astral experience, you want proof. When you say you wake up every morning from dream, you say we know it. I said, do you ever pinch your body to see if you have woken up? Do you open your eyes to check whether you have come into the real world or you are still in the dream world? No. You have still got your eyes closed. You have not moved your little finger. You have not stirred in the bed in which you went to sleep. You have not opened your eyes. Nothing has happened except you have woken up and you know for certain that you have woken up. Where is the proof? You don't even ask for it. You don't even check. What is that sense of certainty that comes to you, which convinces you that you are awake without asking for any proof, without applying any proof, without applying any check on yourself? And if the whole world comes to your bedside at that time and says, look, this is you are not awake yet, you are still sleeping, you will not accept the opinion of the world. You say, I know I am awake. What are you telling me? What is the basis of the certainty of your knowledge? If there is a basis, you tell me. Then I will tell you the basis of the certainty of knowledge of the astral level. Most of the time, when I put this counter question, they don't have the answer. So I have to give the answer on their behalf also as to why they are so certain that they have woken up. We are certain that we are awake in the morning not because of the new experience we have got, but because of the old experience we have got of having gone to sleep. If we did not remember that we went to sleep, we would never be sure that we are awake. This is the answer. The answer is when we wake up in the morning, the first thing that happens is, yes, this is the same bed where we went to sleep. It is the memory, the recall of the sleeping out of bed that gives us the instant certain knowledge we have come back where we slept. If this memory were not there, in certain cases of amnesia, people lose their memory, they mix up the dream state and the wakeful state. They do not know that they are awake. There is no other difference. 
the nature of experience is such that they can carry on from one level of consciousness to another without knowing it except for the recall in memory that they went to sleep. It is precisely the same proof that comes when you shift to a higher level of consciousness. You do not go and see a fantastic sight. You do not go and have strange visions. If you really shift your level of consciousness to the astral level, you awake into the level where you were before and you recall that you were there before you went into the dream state of wakefulness. It is this recall personally of that state of living earlier for thousands of years you have been there. That continuum is picked up directly by you. And once you personally remember, oh, this is the same from where we slept into the so-called wakeful existence of a human being, that you know you have come into the astral level of awareness. This does not mean that after you get there, you don't go to sleep. We sleep every night for rest. We sleep there also, again and again, into this lifetime. It is a natural process. Nothing looks very odd once you are woken up. It only looks odd while we are sleeping. Especially if we are having a nightmare. Then it looks pretty bad. We want to wake up. Therefore, when we talk of the inner self and the outer self, we are referring to the two experiences of the self. Otherwise, there is only one self. That self continues to persist, whatever the experience might be. Supposing, in the dream state again, I am taking this example because we have all had dreams. That is why it is easy for me to take this example. The dream state being a state of consciousness lower than the wakeful state. All of us have knowledge. Therefore, I can relate to the dream state and this wakeful state. So, it makes sense when I refer to this wakeful state and a super wakeful state. The relationship is the same. Supposing we go to sleep and have a dream. In the dream, instead of having this human form, we take the form of a bird. A little bird that flies out of the window. Supposing we get that kind of a dream and then wake up. What will we tell others? We will not say we saw a bird flying out of the window. We will say, I was a bird and flew out of the window. Your friends will say, you are not a bird, what are you talking? You should say you saw a bird. You will say, no, I didn't see any bird. In fact, I couldn't see. I was flying out. That means even if the form is completely changed, in a different level of consciousness, what is making you say it was me who was the bird? I flew out of the window as a bird. You can't fly. You don't have wings. It was something different. How can you be there? That was not you. That was a bird. You will say, no, but I flew. What is the link between that bird and the man or woman who wakes up to claim that he or she flew out? The link is the self. The self persisted in the bird and in the wakeful state of the human being. The form is irrelevant. The self persists irrespective of the form. In fact, the self persists whether there is a form or no form. Self is the conscious experiencer. Whoever gets the experience is the self. And the rest is all experience, not experiencer. The self alone is the experiencer, whatever the form may be, whatever the experience might be. Therefore, there is only one self at any level of experience. All the rest is experience. When we have an experience in which there look to be many like the self, then we make a mistake and think they all have the same kind of experiencer or self in them. So we say yourself, himself, themselves. There are so many selves develop. In fact, there is only one self. The one who is saying all this. It looks funny. I should be talking like this in a group where there are so many people, each one thinking, now which is the self? Am I the self or he or who else? Or my neighbor sitting next to me? There is only one self. If you can find out more than one in this group, tell me. Can there be an experiencer split up into two parts who can say, I am experiencing from here and there? Certain yogis, by the process of development of siddhis, have had the experience of being at more than one place. In truth, I have had that experience once while I was working with a yogi in Hosharpur district in Punjab long ago. 
And the experience I thought would be a good experience to denounce this theory that self must always remain unified into one. I said, now let's see. I will be at two places at the same time and meet people and talk to them. Let us see what happens to the self. There will be two selves split up. Then I will denounce the theory that there is only one self. But what was the actual experience? I experienced the self only at one place at one time. People saw me at two places. Therefore, the experience has continued to be one. The yogis who have had that experience continue to be the experiencing self at one place, even if they can be seen by others at other, uh, two places. It has not happened that the self that gathers the experience has ever been split. It creates the illusion of split, creates the illusion of there being more than one, and therefore there being the many. This illusion goes on. Here, we have created an illusion of millions, just like ourselves. Therefore, there must be the self. The experience of the millions is of one self, the experiencer. Only one experiencer exists, all others are experience. When you awake to a higher level of consciousness, still there is only one experiencer who has woken up. And the rest were his dream. When you awake further, there is again one experiencer. The rest of the whole astral level was a dream. When you awake up further into the causal level, there is only one experiencer. The rest is dream. When you ultimately reach the highest single creator, he alone was the self. There was no other self. He alone was the dreamer. And all the levels of consciousness were his dreams. Therefore, there is only one conscious being. And that is the creator. And what he is conscious of is his dream. And what he is conscious of is his creation. What we call creation today is nothing more than the material which is the subject matter of consciousness of the one conscious being. Therefore, there is only one creator and whatever he creates is what he is conscious of. What is the nature of that? If there is only one Creator, what will be his nature? Consciousness. Because if he is not conscious, how can we be conscious? He can't put consciousness into his creation if he is not conscious of it. And if he is conscious, he can't create another one parallel to himself. The truth is, there is only one self, the total creator. And as these levels of creation or levels of consciousness are generated, he creates the illusion of the many. And as an illusion is created within an illusion, a dream within a dream, it becomes so complex, so real, the illusion becomes perfect. And it looks like we are all equally real. And we forget who the self is. When we have a dream, we don't use the body in which we slept to have the dream that is lying in bed. We create a new body, a new form for use in the dream. That body disappears along with the dream. That body does not wake up. We are using a body here and this body is part of this wakeful level of consciousness. This does not go into any higher level. The higher level is the one which is sleeping. When we awake, this, this body disappears. But what remains? The same experiencer which is in this body continues to be in that. The experiencer continues to work. Therefore, when we say outer self and inner self, we are not referring to two selves. We are referring to the level of consciousness at a lower level and the level of consciousness at a higher level. At all times, we have two levels available to us. Right now, we have two levels, the wakeful level and the dream level. When we awake to a higher level, we again have two levels, that level and this wakeful level. When we go to a still higher level, we have two levels. When we go to the highest level of the single creator, we still have two levels, the creator and the creation. These are two ways of looking at the creator's form which is sleeping and the creation, the illusion, which is being experienced at that time. Sometimes a question has been asked, that can it happen that one of them should disappear? Can it happen that the 
creator may decide, let me now suspend my creation for a moment. Let me not have any creation. I don't, I have done enough. Can he do it? If he is consciousness, which he has to be, because we are conscious. If he is consciousness, he has to be conscious of something. Otherwise, he is not conscious. There is no such thing as abstract consciousness. Therefore, once you think that the ultimate creator or ultimate being who creates this is conscious, he has to be conscious of something. Whatever he is conscious of is his creation. Therefore, it is impossible for the creator to be a creator, not to have a creation. If there is no creation, he ceases to be a creator. The word creator can never be applied. If there is nothing to be conscious of, he ceases to be a conscious being. That is why the creator and his creation run together. It is not that once upon a time there was a creator and then there was creation. Because if there was such a thing as once upon a time, then this once upon a time would have been prior to the creator. In which case, time is more paramount than the creator. Time is more paramount than a junior creator at the mind level. It is called the universal mind. The universal mind is also called the creator. But this is the creator who once upon a time created this universe. But the ultimate creator who transcends time could not have once upon a time available to him. Once upon a time means time was already there. If time was not there in the created time, then he and his creation were there together at all times. Therefore, the truth is that the inner and the outer form at all levels of consciousness have always been together. Some Eastern philosophers have used this fact to put forth the hypothesis that there is no difference between the inner and the outer form. The inner is the experience and the outer is the experience. Both must go together. That one is incomplete without the other. Therefore, if there is a reality within us, that reality only lasts as real in relation to the illusion outside. If there is no illusion outside, the reality also disappears. We can only change the level of illusion. We cannot find the reality directly. So when we refer to the inner and outer self, we are referring to the relatively real, to the illusion relative to that reality. It is constantly at every level of creation, at every level of consciousness, the same situation. I went into a bit of deeper philosophy, but now I will bring you back to a more concrete situation. And that is, we talk of reversing this flow of attention from outside to inside to discover our reality. We say meditation is the art of withdrawing our attention from outside to inside. That means we are constantly talking of a world outside and a world inside. I would like to ask you, where is that world inside? Where will you see it? This world you are seeing outside means outside your body. Naturally, when we say outside, we say this world which you are seeing is not real, it is outside. Find the real world inside. Inside where? Inside what? Alright, we say inside your head. Will it be a very small world that can be, that can be all confined in this head? And if you become the experiencer of the world inside, Will you use this body or some other? And if you use another body, the astral body, for seeing the world inside, will you see it inside that body or outside that body? It will be seen outside. Therefore, this again is an illusion. In relation to this experience, we call it inside. Actually, all experience is experienced outside the point of consciousness. The experience of any level of consciousness is always outside the level of consciousness. It does not happen that this experience is being seen outside, that will be seen somewhere inside. It may be looking inside because we will close the sense perception open to this body. We may close these eyes, we may close the ears, we may close the sense perceptions, and still we can experience, to that extent, metaphorically speaking, figuratively, we will say it is not outside this body that we are experiencing. Otherwise, it is always seen outside the experiencer. 
the experiencer will always see the world outside, whether it is inside or outside. A dream takes place in our own mind. There is no outside. But where do we see it? Do we see it inside the head? We are unconscious of the body. Where do we see it? Where is the dream world? Leave aside where the world is. Supposing we go to sleep at 11.30 at night and we start having a dream at 11.39 after nine minutes of sleep. Now I'm going by the ex experiments conducted by people in this country on sleep and dreams. I'm taking case studies from their album, their portfolio. It's an actual case study I'm taking from them. We go to sleep at 11.30 at night. At 11.39, we get into the dream state, which is discovered by the observers of the sleeping person by watching his eyelids. And when the eyelids are fluttering, they know the dream sequence has started. And if the eyelids are fluttering like this, they know he is seeing things up and down, maybe waterfall or something. And if the eyelids are fluttering this way, they know he is seeing something moving like this, maybe a tennis match. Therefore, if the eyelids are fluttering, they wake up the subject. And he can tell what he is dreaming and they put him back to sleep. Because most of the dreams are forgotten and the subject who records on tape recorder what he is dreaming also forgets that he had a dream. A person sleeps at 11.30, starts a dream at 11.39 and starts dreaming that he has gone to a far-off land as a child for education. He's in a university, very old university. Very big stones are there. He's taken by a guide of that university who tells him, look at these stones and that house. It is 1400 years old. He looks at the stones and the building, it is really very old. 1400 years old building, he sees it. He looks back, what would have been happening 1400 years ago, 1400 years ago in this building. He looks at all that. He walks about, he gets educated. He comes back, he gets married, he has children. He sends his children to the same university because it is so old. And years have passed since he went to university. He sends his children there. The children go and come back and praise the university which the father had seen when he was a student. And then the father wants to marry the children. And at that time, some episode takes place and he wakes up. And the time at that time is 11.44. Mm -hmm. Five minutes have passed since he went to sleep. What has happened in these five minutes? Well, I want to know where is the 1400 years of the existence of that university which he personally experienced? He did not merely experience a lifetime of 20 years of going to school, coming back, getting married, having his children, sending them back. Apart from this lifetime that he experienced, he experienced 1400 years of the age of that building. He saw that. He experienced it. He was sure. When was it created? Five minutes ago. It wasn't there before that. Before he went to sleep, it wasn't there. And when he woke up, it disappeared. Where did it go to? Where did that 1400 years come from and where did they go away? That means there is an illusion of 1400 years. He created time backwards. By the nature of the stones and the statement of the guide in the dream, he created a period of 1400 years. By the nature of flashes of experience that he got, quick flashes, every few seconds he passed several years. Those few frames of experience that he saw in five minutes created his life. And if he had seen that university at night with the moon shining, the space in which the moon hung, and the space beyond, millions of miles across, also disappeared in five minutes. In a very short time of a few minutes, he created a real world of time and space of dimensions unknown to him in the wakeful state. Therefore, when we talk of time, space and these things here, we create them according to our needs. We say there is infinite time in the past available to us. When did this world start? We are going on investigating. 
must be billions of years ago. We study so much. When we wake up, all the billions of years go away. The real billions of years stay in the higher level of consciousness. This illusion of time and space is created to sustain the dream sequence. Therefore, we create the entire scene, including time and space, at a different dimension to put our experience into. Let us not feel that there is a world above a world into which we move. There is only one world from which we create the illusions of time, space and events and of our own identity. But the one common thing that persists at every level of illusion is the self. And when the self awakes to reality, is the inner self. When he sleeps, is the outer self. Now at every level there is a conflict between the two selves. At every level there is a conflict between the real self within and the unreal illusory self outside. Why should there be conflict? When the self is one, why should there be conflict at all? The conflict arises because we are doing that in the illusion what we could not do in the reality or vice versa. What we cannot accomplish in a dream, we want to accomplish in reality. What we cannot do in reality, we want to do in the dream. Most of the patterns of our dreams at all levels of consciousness are based on this principle. Therefore, the conflict is inherent in the system. People have said, if this world is like a dream, who sets the pattern? Who has set the pattern of this, that we will see so many people like this, we will grow up like this, we will create cities and towns and worlds like this, we will create a universe like this, and then we will make it so real and create real relationships here. And then we will create all the problems for ourselves with those relationships. And then we will try and find out people who know reality in the unreality and find solutions to those problems. Who sets the pattern for all this? This is not an arbitrary pattern, obviously. When you look at the pattern of life, it does not look like an arbitrary pattern. It seems to be a reaction to some other pattern. We call it the pattern created by the law of karma. The pattern created by the law of action and reaction in a time sequence. The pattern created between what has happened in one dream and another. The pattern created between what happens between one dream and the wakeful state and what happens between the wakeful state and the next dream. And if you look at the lower level of dreams to which we are accustomed, you find the same system applies to those dreams also. It applies in even greater measure to the pattern of life here. This pattern is being created by the previous pattern that obtained when we were awake or by the pattern of the previous dream which went into the wakeful pattern. There is a continuous cycle which we call the law of karma. The law of karma, karma means action. Karma literally means action. It does not mean anything more than that. The law of action means if you have the illusion that you can create do action, then be prepared to have the reaction. If you don't have the illusion, there will be no reaction. If you look at a shadow and it looks like a shadow, it will not hurt you. If you look at a shadow and you don't think it's a shadow, it will hurt you. This is what the law of karma is. Socrates was the first to mention and there is that, you might have read in Plato's works about the three shadows, the three men in the cave. Plato writes about three men in a cave and there is light falling from outside and they are watching their own shadows and they think they are monsters. And they say these monsters are just waiting for us to turn around and jump upon us and they are going to kill us. They are frightened of those monsters, but they are their own shadows. But light is behind them. If they were to turn around and see that the shadows are being cast by their own bodies and there are no monsters, their fear would go. But they do not turn around lest the monsters attack them. A man who is standing in the light outside, the enlightened one, he shouts to them and he says, Why are you so frightened? They are your shadows. They are not real. 
you are casting the shadows because the light is behind you. The light is falling in the cave against which you are standing. Therefore, your shadows are falling in the wall inside the cave. Turn around and see the light. And these three men crouched together and they said, don't turn around. This fellow is mixed up with the monsters. He wants us to turn around, so monsters will jump over us. Plato gives a beautiful account. And he said, this is our situation. He described this as a human situation. He says the light of our real self within, the light of our awakened self who is dreaming within us, falls from within, outside into this world, which is a multi-dimensional screen on which our shadows are falling. Our shadows because we create them. But we take these shadows as real. They are all real people, all ready to deceive us, all ready to eat us up, all ready to attack us, all ready to do all nasty things to us. Let us not turn around. If somebody who is in the light says, why don't you turn around inside and see in the light, these are your shadows. This guy is also mixed up with the devil, I think. He wants us to turn around so they can attack us. Plato thought this was our human situation. That we are taking these shadows to be real because we are unwilling to turn around to see the source of light. And he explains that the source of light is within us from where the shadows fall outside. There's a there's a four-dimensional screen. It's more than three dimensions. Therefore, it looks so real. But it's looking real does not make it less of a shadow. This binocular vision is created because we are using two eyes. This depth in space is created because we are using two ears. The system of perception has been so divided, functionally broken up, that it creates a depth of time and space. And looks so real, we are unable to believe it can be a screen on which things are falling out. But they are. This kind of three-dimensional and four-dimensional effect is being created by the nature of the screen around and by the nature of the projector from within. It looks so real, we are unwilling to turn around and believe that these are shadows. And how can we believe they are shadows? They talk and think differently from us. And that is precisely what they do in the dream also. But they continue to be shadows. So when there is this conflict, we create the conflict and we perpetuate the conflict between our external shadows which we have created with which we are dealing and the internal self which can give light and tell us that they are shadows. This conflict between the inner and the outer self then takes many forms. Since we take the world as real and we do not accept it as a shadow, we are torn between the problems created outside and the need to go to reality within. And it is this conflict that holds us down and does not let us enter into reality. People have problems to solve with the unreal, illusory world outside. Why do they have problems? Because they take it as real. If the outer world was not taken as real, the problems would disappear that very second. We would wake up into reality the moment we have no problems. The problems hold us down. And why are these problems there? Because we take the outer self and the world outside as real. As real as the inside, if not more real. And therefore, this conflict is responsible for us holding us down into the shadow world. As Plato said, if we could turn around once, we would not doubt the nature of the shadows. But we don't turn around even once.